Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Nikolai. It's delightful to be here back in Denmark. I think it's my third visit. Um, I come to the Scandinavian countries quite regularly. I have a wonderful network of colleagues, um, particularly in Sweden, Finland, and in Norway. Um, and um, I have some familiarity with the Danish education system, not a huge amount, but uh, I'm learning as I go. And it, it is really lovely to be here. And we often in Australia hold up the um, Scandinavian education systems, you know, both we recognise some of the problems, but also that there are areas that are, are great strengths and assets that you bring to education, uh, which we find very enriching um, as, as researchers and as educators more generally. So I, after conversations with Nikolai and uh, Connie and, and uh, Thomas, um, I'm focused, focusing very much today on the topic of school development through research practitioner partnerships. I'm using refugee education and some examples from empirical research that I've been doing with colleagues over the last decade with young people and children of refugee background in schools um, to illustrate some of the sort of key ways in which we can build um, really uh, flourishing research and practitioner partnerships in order to sustain and foster um, good education for all. And of course, what that means is highly contested, I understand. So some of the key questions I'm gonna focus on today are how schools and education stakeholders, such as municipalities, non-government organizations, researchers, can together orchestrate the conditions to support sustainable positive change so that all children can flourish. I'm gonna ask how we can nurture theory and practice informed research partnerships to foster links between home, school, community, and stakeholders both inside and outside school to support this flourishing. I'm gonna have a look at what some of the current challenges and opportunities for attempts to transform and develop schools are. And I'm gonna look at some of the kind of uh, theorise some of the ecological connections and disconnections between home, school and community and what that means in terms of how researchers can work with school practitioners to start to bridge those divides. And in particular, I'm going to look at the role that research and researching practices can play in achieving these goals. Not much. Easy. And thank you, Denmark, for putting on beautiful sunshine today. That was unexpected. I rang my husband and it's raining and cold and miserable in Melbourne. So, you know, hey, where would I rather be? So the questions that I've just raised are based on these following assumptions. And the first and the most important one is seeing education as a practice. And what do I mean by that? So education as a practice is and it very much focused on um, thinking about education as dynamic, as ever evolving, as not a finite end or goal or achievement, but is something that is always ongoing. And that's why I use the verb form often. I talk about researching, educating, sustaining, flourishing. And I'm going to use the theory of practice architectures, which we initially developed, and, and some of you may be familiar with the book in 2014, Changing Practices, Changing Education, and in particular, the theory, theoretical lens of ecologies of practices to kind of unpack that further. Um, one of the other assumptions that's really important in all the work that we do, I do as a researcher and I do with others, is that it's very much viewing educational practice from the perspective of the participants in the practice. So it's about research with and for educational practice rather than on others. So it's about co-creating knowledge. How can we do that in ways that support the flourishing and sustainability of the children in our care? So, the structure of today's keynote, I'm going to uh, look a little bit, I'm going to do some theorising at the beginning. So just hold on to your chairs and hopefully this, this will be, um, uh, some of it may be familiar to you, 
um, but I'll unpack it further. So why, why practice lens? Why does practice lens matter when it comes to educating and understanding educational research and the work that we do in schools? I'm going to look at the notion of praxis and practice because in English, they're actually different. They have different meanings. Um, I'm going to then um, uh, look at, dissect a bit more around the theories of practice architectures and in particular ecologies of practice. And then I'm going to spend um, the second half really looking at two case studies. The first case study is of children and young people of refugee background and the kinds of educational, informal learning opportunities that were occurring for them outside school and how those opportunities were actually supporting their education in school. And how we tried as researchers when we were mapping those practices to really bridge the divide between what was going on outside school for these young people and the assets they were bringing into school. And then the second one is very much looking at a school case study itself with young refugee people. And then I'm gonna finish by looking at the implications. What does this mean for school development uh, in terms of research practitioner partnerships, opportunities and challenges? And we'll leave about 15 minutes for questions. Okay, so why a practice lens? This notion of praxis and practice in English. Look, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm guessing many of you are familiar with neoliberalism, are familiar with what Parsi Salbri, the Finnish educator referred to as GERM, the global education reform movement, and the impact that has had on schooling systems across the world. Australia is no exception, I understand, nor is Denmark. So we have the practice architectures of testing, uh, the PISA, the TIMS, et cetera. Um, we have a whole lot of performance mechanisms going on across many schooling systems. Um, in Australia, like the US and England, uh, because Australia borrows from the worst performing education systems in the world, so the US and England, I shouldn't say that, it's not, they're not that bad, but uh, they're not great. Uh, so we've borrowed things like national teacher and leadership standards which have become like another performative measure placed onto teachers and principals. Uh, intensification of workload and also an increasing pressure on schools to be all things to all people, um, particularly as, as society has become more complex and, and fragmented. And one of the things that, that um, I've argued, we've argued is that there's a capa the capacity of educators to focus on uh, what we talk about in changing practices, changing education, which is the dual purpose of education. That education is both about the formation of individuals and it's also about the development of good societies, whatever that may look like, and obviously that's contested. But that that is at stake when models of inputs and outputs, a kind of factory model, if you like, of education is being applied and, and, and schooling systems are, are, are very much you know, at, at its mercy. So in order to meet the needs of individuals and the requirements of societies, this double purpose of education, we need to always think about education as being conducted as praxis. So, so what do I mean by praxis? So in English, um, praxis is understood as very much ethical and morally informed practice, which is why it's not a complete synonym with practice. So that's very much taking, taken from the neo-Aristotelian notion of praxis. I'm trying not to simplify this too much, and you, I'm sure, are far more familiar with the kind of philosophical traditions underpinning praxis. Um, but it's important to say that in English, we understand praxis in that sense. So when I'm using praxis, throughout the lecture, I'm tending to use it in the sense of um, an ethical self-aware action, for example, as educators and researchers that has this moral commitment and this ethical um, uh, tradition. But there's also kind of the neo-Marxist notion of praxis as history-making action in which, um, you know, the action can be for the good, it can be for the bad, and it can be for neither. And that's something, I think that's the notion of praxis that is perhaps more commonly understood in North, particularly Northern Euro, European and Central European nations. But I also added this quote in about praxis from a very early feminist researcher, because um, I think it's really important to think about and to understand praxis is also highly political. 
And I love this quote that Praxis develops theory in the flesh. It's where the physical realities of our lives and here she's talking about minoritized groups. Our skin color, the land or concrete we grew up on, our sexual longings all fused to create a politic born out of necessity. And so I see educational praxis and researching praxis as also highly political. And you know, whatever we do in terms of our practices, there, there is this political component. So drawing on these praxis traditions, researching for and with, so I'm deliberately playing with those rather than on, uh, when it comes to school development is moral and ethical practice. It's actions that shape histories, but can only be judged in the light of history and that it's invariably situated and political. So just to sum up, educating and researching as forms of praxis, praxis comes into being in the day-to-day -day happeningness of our practices as researchers and as educators. So it's not something out there that's abstract. It's actually occurring through practice, our own practices. And the praxis and practice of educating and researching are always in, in, inextricably linked. So as a feminist, I'm just going to position myself, my own praxis as a researcher. That's a passport photo of my mother, 1944. She immigrated from Palestine, a very much a war-torn country, still is, uh, in 1944 to Australia. Uh, she was 20. She spoke no English. She spent the rest of her life on the factory floor, like many migrants who still do today. And she understood the value of a good education. So she may not have been educated, but she had a native intelligence. And so always, I think it's important to position yourself. Where do you come from in terms of your own praxis as an educator and a researcher? And my praxis is very much formed by the disposition that was shaped through being the child of a migrant parent, writing the shopping list in English for my mother, um, forging her signature because she was too embarrassed to sign her own name in English um, because she felt embarrassed about it. She had no English as a second language training. There was no classes. She picked up her English on the factory floor. Um, but she in, in put, put into us a really uh, a kind of fierce commitment to the importance of education. And she wanted her girls to succeed in a way that she was not given the opportunities to do so. Um, so, you know, in a way, everything I do in a sense is, comes from that, that praxis that she has developed, she developed within us. So theorizing education is practice. What do we mean by practice architectures and ecologies of practice? Some of this may be familiar for some of you, but I'm guessing not for others. And so I'm just gonna take us for a little walk through this. So what are practices made of? Practices are composed of, of what we talk about in, 20, in the 2014 book, um, uh, Changing Practices, Changing Education. And we've developed that further and there's numerous publications we've written beyond that. Um, practices are composed of what we talk about say, of sayings, doings and relatings. And those things are not separate, they hang together. And the sayings, doings and relatings are the kind of talk, the ideas, the thinking, the activities and the relationships between people in a practice that make a practice, a particular practice characteristic and recognizable as that practice rather than another one. So for example, I'm standing here doing keynote lecture and there's particular kinds of sayings associated with the lecture. There's particular kinds of activities such as I'm standing here wearing a microphone, I'm being filmed. And there's particular kind of relatings between myself and you as the audience that emerge that make this a recognizable practice when you walk into the room and you see it happening, whether it's here or it's in Australia. But practices don't come out of nowhere. They are made possible in what we've called practice architectures. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. But practices are also not just composed of sayings, doings and relatings, but they connect up to other practices in, a, in what we call ecologies of practices. And we really see that in the schooling system and the different kinds of teaching and learning practices, for example, that connect up with one another or sometimes are disconnected, which is one of the major problems when it comes to refugee children. So why a practice approach and why now? 
there's certainly been a major turn to practice. And Pierre, you know, for, for the sociologist and the anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu, we've got Michel Foucault, we've got the influence of people like Ted Shartsky, who's a practice philosopher from the US, and also um, post-humanist uh, feminism, uh, actor network theory, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been a major turn to practice in the, in the 21st century. And that, that entails a kind of shift from the focus on the individual to a focus more on the material, the non-human elements. So for example, when it comes to testing, rather than asking how, for example, children may be impacted or teachers may be impacted by, by assessing and testing regimes, of course, that's really important, but we can reframe it from a practice lens and ask how are, for example, teachers, how are children being recruited into the practice and the practices of assessing? Can you see the difference? It just, it just changes it. So that you're looking at the practices, how are we being recruited as practitioners or as researchers, for example, into these practices? And what sits behind that, of course, these practices are these practice architectures of national testing regimes like OECD, PISA, TIMS, et cetera. So understanding school development and sustainable school lives from a practice perspective, there's always been that classic sociological dilemma, you know, how do societies, organisations and schools change? Why are they so durable? Uh, frustration of education policy makers. Why are schools, the practices in schools so durable, so resilient, so resistant to change, you know, frustrating. You can see the policy makers pulling their hair out, et cetera. And so one of the things that practice theorists talk about is if we want to understand about how to change or the necessity to transform or change certain practices, then we need to understand the practices themselves, how they come into being, how they continue to persist, persist and why certain practices disappear and others do not or others are transformed. And if we, we need to understand these things in order to bring about sustainable transformation to educational practices. So in terms of just a little bit more digging into this notion of what a practice is composed of, I said before, compact practice is composed of sayings, doings and relatings. And if you go back to the, the ancient philosophers, then philosophy aimed to teach how to speak and think well in the world, there's that kind of moral component. And you can see that, in, if you like, in terms of sayings, how to act well in the material world, the doings, and how to relate well to others, relatings. But these practices, these, these sayings, doings, relatings that compose a practice don't exist, as I said, in the vacuum. They exist and are formed through the medium of language, through activity and work, and through the medium of solidarity and power. And it's the cultural discursive arrangements, the material economic arrangements, and the social political arrangements that together hang together that prefigure certain practices and allow the opportunity for certain practices rather than others to emerge. So for example, when we see the practice architectures of testing coming into Australia over the last 10 years or so, and the impact what that has then done has created a series of new practice architectures around assessing regimes, publishing results of schools, naming and shaming schools, et cetera. But these practice architectures then bring forth particular kinds of practices around how teachers, for example, respond to this, how schools respond, how leaders respond, how education systems respond. And they are made up of things like what's prefiguring them, particular discourse, cultural discursive arrangements, discourses about what matters. There's particular material economic arrangements like the sort of funding that goes into testing regimes in Australia. Right, that material has been, that, those funding, right, um, that funding is going in there and therefore not into other areas. And there's particular social political arrangements, like the kind of changing relationship between teachers and policymakers, with teachers utterly really excluded from policy, because what would they know? So practices are made possible, just to sum up, in practice architectures. But it's really important to say practice architectures don't predetermine practices, right? They don't mean that certain, these practices have to come into being but they make it more likely that it can be so. And they're also ecologically dependent on other practices in how they connect. For example, the way in which teaching practices and certain teaching practices are dependent on, for example, the practices of professional learning 
the policy making that influenced them. I'm not going to take you through this because it's there's so much in it, but just to point out to you, you can see the figure eight there. And what we're trying to show in summing up the theory of practice architectures is that on the side of the individual, you have the same, the practice, you have the sayings, the doings and the relatings that hang together in a practice and make it characteristic of a, of, of a particular and recognisable as a particular practice. And on the other side, the side of the social, you have the arrangements that prefigure and help to bring these particular practices into being. And the circle there is to really show how these things are always dialectical, okay? So it's not one or the other, but they interconnect always. So what do we mean, what do I mean by ecologies of practices? One of the quotes I've used here is um, from an earlier work by Stephen Chemist and uh, Rebecca Mutton, when they were doing work on sustainable education. And they talk about ecologies of practices as distinctive interconnected webs of human social activities that are mutually necessary to order and sustain a practice as a practice of particular kind and complexity. For example, a progressive educational practice. And I'm gonna look at this in more detail when I look at the empirical cases. So the final bit of this theorizing, you've been very patient, um, is talk about um, the rise of the modern schooling system. I'll do that in about 30 seconds. So we have the rise of the modern schooling systems across the world in the late 19th century. And we talk about in our book, and we look at this in more detail later on, um, that, that there's kind of five distinctive practices, if you like, that compose and characterise the, what we call the education complex, the, the modern education system that is characteristic of um, schooling systems across the world. And those five key practices are students learning, both academic and social practices, teachers, uh, classroom educational practices or teaching, educational leadership and administering, and I would add, add in there now, policy making as well, um, professional learning and educational research and evaluation. And those five particular practices are, make up the kind of distinctive ecologies of practice that characterize modern compulsory schooling systems across the world. Uh, but whether those practices actually connect up with one another in particular schooling systems at particular times is a question that can't be answered in the abstract. It has to be done empirically. So when you go to a school, one of the big questions that might be asked is, as for example, as a principal is, you know, how can we bring about change with the, teach, with the teaching? You know, it's all so problematic, et cetera. And one of the questions I'd be looking at is, you know, what's the kind of professional learning that's going on? And does it connect up with um, the kind of discourses, et cetera, that are coming from the, the leading practices? And what does that mean in terms of the teaching and the student learning and the researching? So whether these things connect up or not, or in fact, they disconnect. And I've talked about refugee education as a classic example often of disconnect between what's going on with students learning and, for example, what's happening with teachers' um, pedagogical practices in the classroom. And I'll, I'll illustrate this in a moment. Okay. So what does all this mean in practice for school transformation and development? So I'm gonna begin with the first case study, which is looking at, we called it knowing and learning in everyday spaces. And this was looking at young people of refugee background um, who had started to, uh, I, I'd observed this living in a regional area in, in Australia for many years. These were young people who'd started to kind of do well in, from refugee backgrounds, they'd done quite well in school, they were starting to do well in sport, you know, they were starting to really contribute as citizens, as active citizens. And we wanted to understand not only what was, how, what, what were the things that were helping them to get there? And that it wasn't just about school, that there was something else going on outside school that seemed to be really supporting them. And I knew that because I lived in this regional town. So you get familiar with what's going on. And so we wanted to understand and map that. And I'll just take you through that. So just a bit of context, Australia is uh, what uh, Vertovich calls a super diverse society. Um, in fact, one in, one in two Australians now in the latest census were either born overseas or have a, one parent, at least one parent who was born overseas. We're a very multi-ethnic, ethnic, multi-faith, multilingual society. Uh, Denmark is also um, culturally diverse, but not quite as culturally diverse as Australia. 
Um, so, you know, still uh, there is certainly far more cultural diversity in Australia, in Denmark than there were, was in the past. Um, but, you know, in comparison to Australia, it, it is less so. Okay, so the Australian context, we've had a white Australia policy that some of you might be familiar with, which allegedly finished in the 1970s, but uh, there's still elements of that racism that go on. We have a very punitive um, uh, uh, refugee policy when it comes to um, um, uh, refugees who come so-called illegally. So the ones that come by boat into Australia, get, the boats get turned back, literally get turned back. Uh, if they somehow make it to Australia, they get put in detention centres and, um, uh, you know, they can be there for eight or nine years. But on the other hand, if they come in through the official kind of UNHCR processes, we have very generous resettlement policies, very multicultural, and public opinion is actually very pro-multiculturalism. That's been very, very consistent, except towards certain outgroups. Here's a picture of young men who've been in detention in Australia for probably nine years. They've been put in a hotel and they're protesting. I thought I found this one on the internet and thought, interesting, why Liberal Denmark has adopted one of the world's harshest refugee policies. I'm sure we could talk for hours about that one. So global challenges in Australia. School plays a really important role in building just and equitable societies. There's been a lot of research on social justice and equity and educational leadership, but less so in refugee education. One of the problems around refugees is that they are, tend to be homogenised and essentialised as migrants in policy discourses. What we were really wanting to do was to kind of overcome some of the negative discourses around refugees, because when you read the research, it's all about what they lack, what they don't have, what they don't bring. It's all about deficit. And yet we could see that there was something else happening that was far more positive. So what was the rationale for our first study? We could see very much that South Sudanese young refugee people who constituted the biggest population of refugees in the 1990s and early 2000s in Australia, many of them were falling through the cracks of formal education, but not all of them were failing. And so we asked the question, what might be displaced spaces, places and practices outside formal education that were helping to provide an alternative educational trajectory for these young people? And I'm gonna spend a bit of time on how we did this because I think one of the things that's really important is that we invited 15 young people to participate. Most of them were South Sudanese, but we also had an Afghani young man and um, some people from uh, different African nations. And we formed an advisory group. And I think this is really important to think about research and practice um, and not uh, you know, researching on people. We had, it was made up of stakeholders from the South Sudanese um, elders of Wagga Wagga, um, from education districts. So we got key education policy makers and stakeholders to come and sit on the working group and the advisory group. And we also got non-government people who were working with young refugee people. And they were a really important advisory group that we consulted throughout the life of the project because we wanted buy-in and we wanted to disseminate and influence what was happening. The other thing that we used that was really important because we were really wanting to put the focus back on the young people and hear their voices rather than assuming things about them or having other people talk about them. We asked them to go off and take photos of the people, places and spaces where they felt they were starting to succeed outside school. Where were the places where they felt safety and belonging and inclusion and felt that they were beginning to feel engaged and be part of the broader community? And then we ran a workshop with them and we asked them to come and to select three to five photos that represented their kind of key learnings that they wanted to, to give to, back to us. They, we downloaded the photos, the students were put into small groups and we asked them to talk about why did you select this photo? And we recorded it. And then the other young people had an opportunity to ask questions and talk with them about it. Then we displayed all the photos and we asked the young people just to have a look at them. And then we invited them and we said, we're gonna have a forum where we're gonna to talk to the key people who are making decisions about refugee education in this, in this town. What are the messages you wanna give them? What do you want us to tell them with you? And I wanna give you a little example of, this is what Rosa, who was 16 years old at the time said. She took a photo, she was Catholic, and she took a photo of the rosary beads and the crucifix. Let me tell you, I'm not religious, but it was so interesting to see what the students came up with. 
and she, this hangs over her bed. And she said, the photo, this photo is very important to me because it's one of the main reasons why we live. This is meant to represent church and its values. Church, that's where I got a lot of information about the world, about life, how to cope with if you're, having, you're suffering or a struggle. You just leave the suffering behind for a second and give it up to God. So where was the learning being experienced to these young people? Not surprisingly, technology, a whole range of sites, groups such as faith-based groups in church, sport was a really important thing, uh, places such as, again, church, but also libraries, the public library, art galleries, the shopping mall, training organisations, the park. These are things I would never have picked. And people, caseworkers, sporting coaches, librarians, the elders in their community, family and friends. So we held a forum at the local library because that was the place where the kids said, we, we are, feel supported, we learn a lot there in that library. We brought, invited educators, municipalities, the non-government providers and the advisory group. And we asked them to, to come and hear the findings. We displayed some of the photos and the young people were there and supported the discussions. And we held a celebration afternoon tea with the families and the young people afterwards to celebrate the work they'd done. So in terms of researching with young people, this was very much an attempt to research with rather than on them. We were wanting to co-create knowledge. I would never have come up with this stuff, never in a thousand years. And we very much wanted to research from the inside, which is very much recognising, reflecting, respecting and engaging with those young people's interpretive categories, not ours, their lived realities, their experience, rather than a spectator research, which appears to speak about them. So what were some of the ecologies of informal learning practices that we saw shaping their dispositions, their educational, pro-educational habitus with dispositions? So particularly in terms of if we look at um, uh, church and faith, practices of worship and faith with family and parishioners provided hope and succour. So that, that quote from Rosa is very typical. They connected through a whole range of activities with young people from mainstream Australian backgrounds. This was one, church was one of the few places where they actually met people from a whole range of socioeconomic backgrounds and from mainstream Australian community. They built thing, cultural and social capital through their connections in church, but also in sport. There were educational practices that are engaging in outside school that really built their confidence in formal schooling. One of the kids talked about going to camps and learning how to do public speaking. And so it really helped him when he then went to school and had to do the same sorts of things. But they also were really important pro-social skills, such as volunteering to you know, fundraise for particular church activities, collaborating, team building across, across various um, social groups. So we learnt this crucial role of involvement in faith, but also I'm just talking about faith here, but there are other ones. And we understood that there was an alternative pathway, pedagogical pathway that was being built for these young people outside school and that was helping to shape their educational habitus. So what were some of the opportunities here in terms of research practitioner partnerships for school development? Well, again, foregrounding young, young people as knowledge givers rather than knowledge takers. It allowed us to surface what Louis Mo talks about as the funds of knowledge that these young people brought to the schooling situation to support their flourishing. Making connections between these funds of knowledge and pedagogical practice is crucial for students, and particularly for these students' intellectual and social development and school engagement, but that's often where schools really struggle. And the advisory board was really crucial. But what were some of the challenges? We were conscious that the research was still distant from the school site. How, we, how could we foster more ecological links between schools and the knowledge that was, was coming out here? How to support this traveling of practice? how to build the connections. We could see disconnections between what was going on in school in terms of curriculum and pedagogy, the assumptions that were being made about these young people, what they didn't have, what they lacked. And that was inhibiting their development. So I'm gonna finish by looking at um, a final, well, it's not a final study, but it's the final study in this one, which is looking at refugee education in schools. And it was done with my beautiful Finnish colleague, Dr. Mervi Kalko, who's here in the picture. And Mervi came to Australia for three years, thank you. And she uh, was a postdoc with me doing this study of refugee education in Finland and Australia. 
So we did interviews with young people, with children. This was in primary school, so they're young children, teachers and leaders. We got the children to do drawings and you can see an example of a drawing there. And in that drawing, those drawings, we asked the children to draw pictures of the key moments where they felt they learned something that was really important for their education. And those key moments could be being with their father, actually hunting in the forest or whatever it might be. And the children mapped that through their drawings. And then Mervi and I talked to them about the drawings. What's in here? What are in those drawings? Tell us about this. Why, why have you got these, these various things here? And that was a great way, particularly with young children, to get them talking and not to make an assumption that because English is not their first language, that somehow they're not capable of communicating things incredibly powerfully. And some of the drawings are absolutely heartbreaking. I'm not sure if it's this one, but you know, there's one with a gravestone and a cross and it's the, the child's mother. Um, it wasn't all sad stories, but you know, the, the child talked about that as a learning about their mother's death. And we wanted to understand what our education success looked like through these young, young children's eyes. What did they understand educational success to mean? So how did we select these children? We said to the teachers in the school, we said, we want a cross section of kids. We want gen, you know, cross grade levels, we cross years. And we want children uh, we, who are not just scoring well in tests, all right? In fact, you know, if they're scoring well, great, but that's not the main thing. They might be kids who are really great little active citizens in their classroom. They might be kids who have done, you know, some fantastic things in terms of citizenship, social formation, uh, experience, you know, so it was, it was looking more broadly at academic and social success beyond just test results, etc. cetera. Um, and this was one of the most disadvantaged schools in Melbourne uh, that we were working in, but they had a very strong commitment to um, play-based uh, pedagogy and uh, success for all. So what's, what did we learn about what supported and sustained their flourishing? No surprise, children need to experience a sense of safety. This is for all children, particularly refugees. They need to feel a sense of belonging before they can learn and experience success. Otherwise, they disengage. So this is what one of the teachers talked about. She was talking about um, a unit that the a project that the children were working on, which was water. It was called water. So rather than the teacher making an assumption about water in Australia, you know, in Australia, we're talking about, what are we talking about when we talk water? Beaches, we think of the beaches, we think of the sea, we think of the rivers. But she was really wanting to understand the funds of knowledge that the children were bringing from home, from their own experiences. What were the children bringing and how did they understand water? And so she encouraged this young little, little boy who came from a Burmese refugee background. She said, I started asking him, if he'd ever been fishing in Burma. Don't you love it? Woohoo! Yes. And he used to go fishing with his dad and they'd make traditional fish traps. And so he tried to replicate the fish traps out of cardboard and show people. He'd stand up there with great pride and tell them how they'd catch these fish and then other children would talk about having been on boats or canoes in different areas. So the point I'm making here is the practice architectures of this classroom and this school were set up in ways that encouraged this sort of dialogue rather than saying, we haven't got time to talk about this because we need to do the next literacy test or the et cetera, et cetera. So this is very important. Play was, as I said, a really important part of the pedagogy of the school. It was part of their personalised learning approach. But there was also an acknowledgement that play looked different for different groups of children. So for refugee children, particularly those who were first coming, one of the things that the teachers observed was that the need for them to build things that made them feel safe. The school, they used to bring in a whole lot of um, recycled materials. And they'd leave them just, you know, in big drums around the school. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And the kids were just encouraged to go in and take stuff out of the cartons and the drums and they could do with them what they wanted. And what they saw was a lot of the refugee children were going in and taking some of the ropes and making hammocks, you know, a nice little hammock that you can sit in. And they'd put the hammocks under the tables outside and they'd pull the hammocks around them and they'd swing in them. And that would be what they'd do. Now, the teachers were saying, well, it all looks terribly messy. 
you know, should we make the kids pull the hammocks up at the end of the day? And they said, no, because this is obviously really important for these kids' development. So they left the hammocks there. It became known as the school that was famous for its best knots because the kids got very practised at making these hammocks. But they understood that the, the play that the children were engaging in was a ped an important pedagogical experience that needed to be encouraged, encouraged and nurtured. So what does this mean in terms of the ecologies of practice? That's a photo of um, David, who's the principal of the school. They're very happy for me to talk publicly about them. David's getting um, thrown, he's getting dirt thrown at him and he's got a great big smile on his face. Um, and this is all part of the kind of, you know, informal play that they often would engage in on, on play days and things like that. David also was very involved in doing research with the, with the children and with ourselves. And he actually co-wrote this book, Leading, Creating Powerful Learning Relationships. What I'm trying to show here was there was an absolute connection between the kinds of leading and administrative practices that were going on in the school. And leading is not just confined to the principal, I might add and the sorts of researching practices that were happening through David with the teachers, with the young children. There was also really strong connections between those leading practices and the sorts of professional learning opportunities that the teachers engaged in. So for example, the teachers were reading some key research around refugee children. They were trying to understand some of the disturbing things that were happening around play in the outs, outdoors with the young people when they came, first came, and they would read research about that. And then they would think about well, what does that mean in terms of our pedagogy in the outdoor spaces? Um, and that also then impacted on their, both their pedagogy, but also the students' learning, as you can see from the quote that I put up there. It's about honouring what the children were bringing rather than saying, here's a set curriculum and we need to stick to that. No, you can't talk about fish traps. Sorry, off you go. So finally, the practice architectures of refugee education I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a picture of the school playground, one aspect of it. You can see there's a beautiful big tree there. Uh, there's lots of tr uh, tree trunks, there's um, tan bark down there, shrubs. Most of these children live in high-rise flats. They don't get an opportunity to play in nature. So it's really important for the school that they have these beautiful natural environments. The ki kids were encouraged to play. They're encouraged to jump and, and go up the tree safely um, and to be physical and to experience it. And that was a really important part of the curriculum of the school and of the pedagogical practices of the school very, very different from the more traditional environments that you would see where any principal who allowed a child to go up a tree, you know, would be kind of like, you know, you mustn't do that. You know, what happens if there's an accident and the parents complain? Um, so what did we see emerging here around leading practices? That leading was not just about doing schooling, but there was a broader responsibility, as the principal said, for growing the whole child. Um, focusing on leading as part of an ecology of practice helped us to understand leading as historically and socially constructed practice in for our practice informed by the past and oriented to the future future and that was very much in contrast to the sort of dominant representations of leadership as a form of techne you know technicist sense of, of leading that we're seeing in the school effectiveness and improvement literature so what were some of the opportunities for research and practitioner partnerships for school development throughout the work that we were doing with the, um, the, the, school, um, the school and the teachers and the young people? So first of all, the young pu pupils were being, were being positioned as knowledge givers. Um, and this is really important in trying to sort of contribute to children's flourishing through, for example, the curriculum, the pedagogy. It was really important to document some of the arrangements and ecologies of practice that were fostering children's school engagement, um, particularly given the, you know, the, the crucial role of evidence and what counts as evidence in research these days. But also the importance of ongoing and trusted relationships between the researchers and school. We were in that school for three years, got to know them very, very well. Then they started to tell us the truth. So we start to see a complex picture. Now, uh, at the end, and I can't show you this, I don't have time, but I would encourage you to go onto U YouTube um, Mervi, my, my colleague, um, co-created a story with the children. Um, and the children wrote this story. It was called Ali and the Long Journey to Australia. Then they made these little claymation little figures out of clay, and it was filmed as a claymation film. It's heartbreaking and it's beautiful. Go and have a look at it. So what were some of the challenges of our partnerships with for school development? It takes time. Teachers were engaging at different levels. 
how could we foster more dialogue and reflection on what was going on in terms of the educational practice and how to influence change beyond the individual school gate. So I'm going to finish, don't worry, Nicola. This is my second last slide. So what do we know about school development through research practitioner partnerships? This is, this is the summing up. It needs to be informed by a dialectic between imperial research, empirical research and theory. It needs to pay careful attention to diverse arrangements and the colleges of practices that inform how children experience their education in specific sites. There's no one formula. And it needs to map these ecological connections and disconnections between, empirically between practices. It's really important to honour the site-specific conditions in which educating is taking place. So not just looking within school, but beyond school. And also understanding there's no one size fits all formula. And it's also challenging. It's important to challenge some of those, on, those traditional onto epistemological assumptions about research. So for example, who's praxis? Who is the researcher and the research? Who is being included and excluded? So I'm gonna leave you with some questions for school development through research practitioner partnerships. What constitutes good researching practices for school development through these partnerships? Whose praxis are we talking about? There's a question of power. I'm comfortable. We have to, we have to as researchers, confront these questions of power in these partnerships. Researching for whom? Who's benefiting? Who loses out? Researching to what end and for what purposes? What are the sorts of assumptions that are shaping our research practices and partnerships? As I said, who is the researcher and the research? Who is included? Who is excluded? Where are the, blind, the gaps? So how do research practices that we use facilitate insights into individual and collective participants' experiences and practices? And finally, and this is uh, you know, using Herb Biester's work around the learnified environment of 21st century education. How can research speak back to the learnified environments of performativity and pressures that education and schools are facing the world. So if you want to know more, there's lots more, but uh, this is a more recent book that I've written, which both theorises but also uses empirical cases, not only in refugee education, but across a range of areas. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you.